and then come back to the hymn. Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good to see everybody this morning here at Mount Olivet as we come together to worship our risen Lord and Savior together. Welcome to everybody who is here in person and everybody watching us online. Uh, good to have all of you. Uh, I hope everybody's received a copy of the bulletin. Inside the bulletin is our announcement sheet as well as our, well as our prayer list on the other side. I just want to hit a few things if I may real quick. Uh, again, Vacation Bible School starts on Sunday, June 25th. Uh, if you know of a child who is uh, any age from entering into kindergarten through entering into the fifth grade, uh, we want them here. And so sign them up either online or, or we have paper registrations as well for anyone who might need that. Uh, but do bring them uh, those particular days. It's again, Sunday, June 25 through Wednesday, June 28. Uh, there's also a bulletin board that if you want to volunteer, there's still some spaces available. Uh, sign up and we'll make sure we put you where we need to put you. Uh, for those that have signed up to be a part of our summer bowling league team, it starts tomorrow night. All right, so be at the bowling alley at 6 o'clock tomorrow night, and we'll start a run for 10 successive Monday nights uh, each and every Monday from now until, until August. Of course, what that means is that our disc golf uh, ministry has been moved from Monday to Wednesday nights. So you can still go out and throw discs whenever you want to, but our official uh, devotions and discs night is now on Wednesdays at 530 at the course up on uh, north end next sunday at three o'clock you're invited to come here and to color and cut out and maybe even laminate one of these guys all right this is flat jesus and what we're going to do this summer is everybody who wants one will get a flat jesus and what we want you to do is if you go out fishing or go to the beach or go to a ball game or go on vacation wherever you go take your flat jesus with you and take a picture of your flat jesus wherever it is you are and send us the picture and what we're going to do is have a bulletin board showing all the different places that Jesus has traveled this summer. We can put them on our social media sites just a way for us to maintain some connectivity during the course of the summertime and also to remind everybody that Jesus is, in fact, uh, everywhere. So come to your flat Jesus next Sunday at 11 o'clock. I'm sorry, at 3 o'clock next Sunday the 11th. If you can't make it, we got blank uh, Jesuses in the, um, in the office. You can pick one out and color it and cut it out at home if you want to, if you want to do that. Uh, Thursday night is Mount Olivet night out at the ballpark. So if you want to go see the Scallywags for free, you got a code by email a couple of weeks ago. If you still need it, let me know. If you go online and buy tickets and use our code, then you get free tickets. So again, they're playing at the baseball field at the high school. They're designated as Mount Olivet night. It's also a Roanoke Island food pantry night. So take a couple of canned goods there if you want to. But anyway, that is this Thursday. First pitch is at 7. The gates open at 6. Also, they announced this weekend that Tuesday night, if you take your bulletin over there, they'll knock two dollars off the cost of a ticket. So you can go all weekend, all week if you want to. You can go Tuesday night, get a couple of dollars off. You can go Thursday and hang out with them. Then it's all, all a good time. 
Uh, if you are a veteran or a first responder, uh, at our patriotic concert on July 2nd, they want to do a slideshow that honors your time in service. And so what they're asking you to do is, the choir is, is to uh, email or bring to us a picture of you in your uniform, uh, tell them when you served, uh, what branch you served in, and they're going to put you on a slideshow that honors your service. Again, that's all veterans and first responders. And if you have a family member who served, we'd like to get their information as well, so send that to us. And then with the summer starting, it also means it's an opportunity for us to feed the lifeguards out at the beach. Our first opportunity is on June 22nd. So there's a sign-up sheet outside the main office. There's also an opportunity in July as well as an opportunity in August to do all that. Our uh, June newsletters are now out. They were emailed to everybody as well as posted on our social media sites. But if you want a paper copy, they're floating around the church as well. And the last thing I have to you, uh, SC Bass Knight handed it to me this morning. Many of you know that uh, Faye O'Neill passed away uh, a few weeks ago. Well, uh, Brian and the family sent us a thank you note. Just wanted to thank everybody for the prayers, the visits, and food uh, that the family received during this difficult time. So thank you on behalf of that particular family. All right, well. Yes. The Methodist men will be meeting on Tuesday night at 6 o'clock for the 13th of June. Sandy Pace from the Dare Center for uh, the Senior Center will be our guest speaker. Tuesday, June 13th. 13th. Yep, that's right. <coughs> and also, Nanny Midgets, y'all are meeting on Tuesday at 10 o'clock here at the church. So don't forget that. All right, well, friends, let's put our hearts and minds together and go to the Lord. Most gracious and holy one, we thank you for this beautiful day that you've given us. Made beautiful because the sun is shining outside and we can feel your presence and the breeze as it blows against our face. But beautiful, Lord, because we can come together as brothers and sisters and be in worship of you. And so we thank you for gathering us in together. Whether it be in person or online, we thank you for bringing us in. And as we go through this worship service this morning, Lord, we ask that through the Holy Spirit that dwells inside each of us, that you open our hearts, our minds, and our ears to what message you have for us this morning. Whether it be in the songs or the prayers or the proclamation of your word and the baptism, Lord, what message is there for us this morning? Help us to hear your voice. We thank you for your presence here with us. We thank you for the Holy Spirit that dwells inside each of us. We thank you for our Savior, Christ Jesus. A gift given to us we can never earn, nor do we rightly deserve, but given to us out of your abundant love for each of us. We pray these things in his holy name. Amen. Well, friends, let us now get our hearts and minds ready for worship.
uh, Jeff Adlon on the trumpet there. He is Ruth Adlon's son who sings in our choir, and he's going to play at least a couple other things for us this morning. So let's welcome Jeff here to Mount Olive. <laughs> I want to invite you now to stand as you're able and join me in our call to worship. Uh, it's found on page 743 of our hymnal. We'll also go over to page 744 for a little bit. But we're starting on page 743. Our call to worship this morning is Psalm 8. O Lord, our Lord. Your glory is chanted above the heavens by the mouth of babes and infants. You have set up the defense against your foes to seal the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have established, what are human beings that you are mindful of them? And mortals that you care for them. Yet you have made them little less than God. You have given them dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under their feet. All sheep and oxen. And also the beasts of the field. The birds of the air and the fish of the sea. Whatever passes along the paths of the seas. O Lord, our Lord. How majestic is your name in all the earth. We invite you to remain standing as we sing our opening hymn. It's found on page 61. Come Thou Almighty King, page 61. disciples to come forward for our children's message. Good morning. Well, welcome. It's good to have you. What's your name? And Caroline, really? I have a Caroline. What's your name? Grace. Caroline and Grace and our guy Hudson. Good to see you, man. Did you have a good week? Yeah, pretty good. All right. Oh, what's happening, buddy? <laughs> yeah, that's all right. Optimus Prime? Yeah, very cool. I like Optimus Prime. <laughs> what's your name, man? What's your name? What? Jameson. Very good. Good to have you. Caroline, Grace, Hudson, and Jameson. All right, let me ask you a question. 
What is this? It's a dollar. Raise your hand if you would like for me to give you this dollar. <laughs> Some of the older folks, too. I want to ask you this. What if I took this dollar and I folded it like this? Raise your hand if you still want this dollar. All right. What if I took this folded up dollar and I crinkled it up like this? Raise your hand if you still want this dollar. Well, if I took this folded, crinkled up dollar and put it on the ground and I stepped on it and did my foot like this on it, raise your hand if you still want this dollar. <coughs> Caroline says no, not so much anymore. <laughs> raise no, so much. Right. So the reason why you still want this dollar, even after I folded it and crinkled it up and stepped on it, <laughs> is because even having done all of that, this dollar doesn't lose its value, right? It's still a dollar. Similarly, your value to God never changes. All right? So no matter how many mistakes you might make, no matter how many wrong turns you might take, no matter how many times you might get in trouble, no matter how many times you and your sister might not get along or you and your sister might not get along, God still values you. And God's value to you is that he considers you to be his. As his son... James and his son or girls as his daughter. That means he loves you bigger than any love ever known in this world. And that doesn't change, right, because of the value God has on you. And so what he just asks us in return is for us to reflect that same kind of love to others that we meet. And so we're asked to be kind and loving and considerate and share our toys and stuff with other people and listen to our teachers and our moms and dads and our grandpa and grandpas and that kind of stuff. But even if we mess that up, God still loves us. And we still have value in his sight. So no matter what anybody else will ever, ever say about you, you are God's. And he loves you. All right? Let's have a prayer. Dear God, we give thanks to you that you value us. That you love us. That we matter to you. Help us to always remember that and try to live like people that are loved by you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, friends, thank you very much. It was nice meeting you too. Nice meeting you, Jameson. Well, we get to celebrate the Holy Sacrament of Baptism. This morning. So, if I would like to invite the Emory family uh, to come forward at this time. And so, as they're making their way up to the front, I want to uh, mention something that they told me yesterday, and I told the choir right before we came out. And if I get any of this wrong, coach, I apologize. But the dress that Eleanor B. is wearing this morning dates back to 18, 1884. Was made in Ireland? No, I think it was the first generation. The first generation of, of Irish immigrants wore it. And it's been worn by every Emory child, even, even him, <laughs> <laughs> when, they, when they have been baptized. So I thought that was kind of neat that that's, that's part of this service as well. So anyway, so welcome. It's, it's good to have you guys. And friends, if you have your bulletin and you have the uh, baptismal liturgy inside, I invite you to pull it out now because there's a part you get to play in it as well. Brothers and sisters in Christ, through the sacrament of baptism, we are initiated into Christ's holy church. We are incorporated into God's mighty acts of salvation and given new birth through water and the spirit. All this is God's gift offered to us without price. Since the earliest times, the vows of Christian baptism have consisted first of the renunciation of all that is evil and then the profession of faith and loyalty to Christ. So on behalf of the whole church, I ask you, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? If so, say, I do. Do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil? injustice and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? If so, say, I do. Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in his grace, and promise to serve him as your Lord, 
in union with the church which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races? If so, say, I do. Will you nurture this child in Christ's holy church, that by your teaching and example, she may be guided to accept God's grace for herself, to profess her faith openly, and to lead a Christian life? If so, say, I will. Okay, congregation, do you, as Christ's body, the church, reaffirm both your rejection of sin and your commitment to Christ? If so, say, we do. Will you nurture one another in the Christian faith and life and include these persons now before you in your care? With God's help, we will proclaim the good news and live according to the example of Christ. We As the Apostles' Creed in threefold question and answer form appeared at least as early as the third century as a statement of faith used in baptisms and has been widely used in baptisms ever since. We now join with the universal church across the ages in this historic affirmation of the Christian faith. My friends, do you believe in God the Father? I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? Holy Spirit. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, the life everlasting. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Eternal Father, when nothing existed but chaos, you swept across the dark waters and brought forth light. In the days of Noah, you saved those on the ark through water. After the flood, you set in the clouds a rainbow. When you saw your people as slaves in Egypt, you led them to freedom through the sea. Their children you brought through the Jordan to the land which you promised. In the fullness of time, you sent Jesus, nurtured in the water of a womb. He was baptized by John and anointed by your spirit. He called his disciples to share in the baptism of his death and resurrection and to make disciples of all nations. Pour out your Holy Spirit to bless this gift of water and those who receive it, to wash away their sin and clothe them in righteousness throughout their lives, that dying and being raised with Christ, they may share in his final victory. All praise to you, eternal Father, through your Son, Jesus Christ, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns forever. Amen. Thank you. ready? All right, you look ready. Ready to do this? Eleanor B. Emery, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. May the Holy Spirit work within you, that being born through water in the Spirit, you may be a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. Amen. Congregation, it is now your turn to welcome our new sister in Christ. Members of the household of God, I commend this child to your love and care. Do all in your power to increase her faith, confirm her hope, and perfect her in love. We give thanks for all that God has already given you, and we welcome you
Emory family, may the God of all grace, who has called us to eternal glory in Christ, establish you and strengthen you by the power of his Holy Spirit, that you may live in grace and peace. Amen. 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 Let's give them a... So on behalf of the church, we have here a blanket made by our blanket ministries here, as well as her baptismal certificate. And then our children's ministry also likes to give all of our baptized kids a little lamp who is in, in that package there. So congratulations.
now to our time of prayer for and with one another. Just a few reminders and announcements for those that might be the first time with us. Uh, in each and every pew is one of these prayer request cards. If you have someone, something you want our church to be an honest and earnest, fervent prayer for, I encourage you to fill one of these cards out and then drop it in one of our two offering boxes once worship has concluded. If it's something personal, something private, something you want known just between you and I, still fill one of these out and just put it in my hand once worship has concluded or drop it on my desk uh, on your way out. If you're watching us online, use whatever comment function is available to you or just put unspoken prayers in there if it's not something you want the whole world to see. But we do come back through and gather in all your prayer requests uh, as well. Uh, our prayers this morning are responsive in nature. Uh, after each petition, you'll hear me say, Lord, in your mercy. And if you feel so led, I invite you to respond by saying, hear our prayer. So again, I'll say, Lord, in your mercy, and you'll say... Yeah. Toward the end of our prayer time together is a space of silence where if there is a name you want to, to lift up aloud, please do so. If you'd rather just keep it to yourself, certainly that's fine. And do know that our altar rail is always open uh, before, during, and after worship. So you, should you feel so led to come forward and pray in that fashion. But friends, let us now in the power of the Spirit pray to God the Father through his dear Son that he would accomplish his will for the church, the world, and all people for whom we pray. Let us pray. We adore you, O Lord, and confess that you are one God in three persons. With God the Son and the power of God the Spirit, we are bold to pray to God the Father as our Father. We do not deserve and can barely comprehend such a wonder. All we can do is bless your holy name and proclaim your goodness and grace to the world. Lord, in your mercy. Grant that your church may always worship your triune nature in unity and confess that your unity is that of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Give the church such wisdom and faith that it may rightly proclaim your name to the world and give it such humility and grace that through it many come to know, trust, and love you, the Lord and Savior of the world. Lord, in your mercy. You commanded the church to go into all nations, making disciples, baptizing in your name, and teaching others to observe all that you have commanded. Keep your persecuted servants faithful to that great commission, even when it would be easier to fall away. Let us more comfortable Christians not be a scandal to their witness, nor a stumbling block to believers. Lord, in your mercy. Make this congregation a temple fit for your holy presence. Let all we say and do glorify your name. Bind us together in your love. Use us to introduce you to those who don't know you yet. Lord, in your mercy. Bless, heal, and comfort all who suffer, especially those that we bring before you now, either aloud with our lips or silently in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy. 
Holy God, thank you for your mercy to those who have died trusting in your promises. Visit us with your wisdom, love, and forgiveness. Teach us the moves and graces of your triune fellowship. Give us joy and delight as we imitate you. Bring us into your presence with the whole company of the redeemed. Let us gaze upon your blessed countenance and adore you as our Lord and God, O Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever unto the age of ages. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers, O Father, for the sake of Jesus, your Son, and by the power of your Holy Spirit, bring what is pleasing in your sight to fruition in our lives. It's in his name we pray. Amen.
Thank you, choir. Well, friends, our gospel lesson this morning and our sermon text comes from the Gospel of Matthew. We're in the 28th chapter. We're going to take a look at verses 16 through 20. So again, this is Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 through 20. It says, Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. My friends, this is the word of God for you and I, the children of God. Thanks, Thanks be, to be to God. Well, friends, our daughter Caroline turns 19 a week from tomorrow. And every year around her birthday, my mind always seems to drift back to those first few days after she was born. Now, I recognize that our experiences were not necessarily unique. And many of you will resonate with what it is that I'm about to say. But you see, for two days after she was born, but before we were discharged from the hospital, our room was a revolving door of family members and friends and doctors and nurses and consultants. It was rare that we were by ourselves in that room during the waking hour. Oftentimes, folks would just pop in. Now, truthfully, sometimes we'd ring the bell and have folks come in to us, but there were always people around. And on the day in which we were all discharged, we put Caroline in her little carrier and put the carry into the base that was fastened in the back seat of the car. And we made the drive from Women's Hospital to Greensboro to Burlington, which is where we were living at the time. We parked in the driveway, I pulled the carrier out of the base, and we walked into our house for the first time as a family of three. And I remember taking that carrier and putting it on the coffee table. And we looked lovingly and adoringly at this Miracle from God. And with our eyes welling up with tears of joy as to just how lucky we truly were, Heidi and I turned and we looked at each other and we froze. <laughs> now, I'm sure it wasn't for more than a few seconds, but it seemed like an eternity. We froze because we didn't know what to do next. <laughs> We hesitated. We were stuck. We wavered in our confidence as to what we knew. Now, we had taken all the classes, and we had read the brochures, and we had read the pamphlets. We had asked questions in the hospital. The first round of pediatric visits were already scheduled. We had acquired all of this knowledge, and truthfully, friends, we knew what to do. But right there, in that moment, as joy-filled as it was, as happy as we were, we were so overcome with emotion, so overcome with everything happening now so fast that we just froze. <laughs> Friends, I think that's what's happening in our story today. Now, every time you've heard this story, it's been preached as Jesus' great commission. And I'm not up here this morning to downplay that, to downplay the impact of it, to downplay the importance of what Jesus is telling all of us to do. But I want us to focus in on verse 17 and verse 20. Because I think it is likely that these disciples were so overwhelmed with emotion in verse 17 that they froze. And I think Jesus knew it and then gave them and us a promise so that any time a situation like this would arise in their lives or our lives, we'd find comfort in it. 
Now, understand that this is the first time in the Gospel of Matthew that the disciples have come face to face with the resurrected Jesus. It seems they have now listened to the command from the ladies at the tomb who said, Jesus told us to tell you to go to Galilee. And so they do. And there they see Jesus. And they are overcome with emotion and they worship in the exact same way as the women worshipped in the garden. Now the word used for worship in the original Greek in verse 17 is a word that means more than just the simple act of worship. It also represents the motivation behind worship. The disciples here worship by falling down before someone whom they feel a sense of complete dependence. It's a worship of devotion and submission of awe and reliance and need. And it's the kind of worship that I think you and I would agree is a worthy response to seeing Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, for the first time. But it's not the only thing they're experiencing. Because verse 17 also indicates that there was doubt. Now we are not told who doubted or how many of them doubted, but they are definitely experiencing the word used here as doubt. But here's where we need to be careful. Because the word here used as doubt in the original Greek doesn't have the same meaning that many of us this morning think doubt does. Or in other words, the Greek word here doesn't have the same meaning that many of us associate with what it means to doubt. This particular Greek word, the original language in which Matthew's gospel was written, there is not a single hint that the word used here as doubt means unbelief, right? It's better associated with the common anxiety response of freezing. The definition of the word refers to wavering or hesitating. So the disciples worshipped and they froze. Or it's like one of my commentaries says, everything is happening too fast. And this is not something very easily explained or defined in Greek. And so the word used for us in the English is doubt but they froze. And it's here, friends, like we so often encounter Jesus doing, that our God comes to these disciples and comes to us, meeting his disciples where they are, lifting them to a new focus. Now, Jesus doesn't speak to them and explain all the details of what's going on like he did with the two fellows walking to Emmaus. But he does speak with authority. And he gives these disciples a driving purpose that can help them leap out of this state of hesitation and wavering that they are experiencing. In other words, Jesus Christ gives them a task rooted in a new way of being that they can return to time and time and time again whenever they feel stuck or hesitant about what to do or wavering about what is right or friends any time they feel frozen. And that task is simple is to remember that Jesus is with us always. That Jesus is with us always. This is Jesus' gift to all of his disciples across time and place. Because he knows us to be people who know that we are completely dependent upon him, yet we also get overwhelmed with both good and bad things that makes us Waver. Jesus is with us always. One of my commentaries says this. It says, all true Christians should lay hold upon the promise of Christ's unending presence and keep it in mind. Christ is with us always. Christ is with us wherever we go. He came to be Emmanuel, God with us, in Matthew 1, 23. When he first came to the world, he declares the same here when he comes to the end of his earthly ministry. 
He is with us daily to pardon and forgive. He is with us daily to sanctify and strengthen. He is with us daily to defend and keep, to lead and to guide. He is with us in sorrow and with us in joy. He is with us in sickness and with us in health. He is with us in life and with us in death. He is with us in time and with us in eternity. What stronger consolation could believers desire than this? Whatever happens... They are at least never completely friendless and alone. Christ is ever with them. He has said it, and he will stand by it. He has promised never to leave us or forsake us. None have such a king, such a priest, such constant companionship, and such an unfailing friend as the true servants of Christ. The Savior in heaven never slumbers and is never sleeping, is always ready to help. Though we faint, Jesus is never weary. Though we are weak, Jesus is almighty. No situation can be faced, no circumstance arise, no problem rear its head, which the Christian has to face without Christ. Christ is always with them to aid them and help them. Friends, that promise, God's promise, is the solution for human wavering. Seeking the God who is with us in every circumstance. Doing what it is that Christ has taught us to do. Living in everyday communion with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We can turn our moments of wavering into moments of discerning. When we find ourselves frozen and unable to act, we can pause, reflect, seek God, and seek God's wisdom. We can do that through prayer. We can do that through wise counsel. We can do that through doing our work with others. And friends, we do it as disciples who know that worshiping and wavering are not polar opposites. It's just what it means to be finite human. In fact, wavering is not sinful in itself. Maybe we should look at it as a gift given to us by the Creator that creates space for us to actually practice being Christ's disciples. And so how do we practice it? We practice it like this. Jesus first, Jesus last. Jesus first, Jesus last. Friends, I didn't come up with that. Keith Martin did. <laughs> a few weekends ago at youth, we invited Robin York to come and teach us a class on painting. And she taught all of us how to paint this beautiful anchor that harkens back to a Hebrew's birth. And towards the end of our time together, when it's dead quiet, because everybody's trying to finish their paintings, Keith all of a sudden blurts out in the midst of this silence, Jesus first, Jesus last. Everybody put their heads back down and continue painting. <laughs> then a few minutes later, Keith again spoke into the silence. Jesus first, Jesus last. And then he did it again. 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 And he did it again. And he did it again. And then when we were done, everybody went home. Now, the next day, I went on a run. And I found myself up by the amphitheater here. And I was running that loop in front of the amphitheater. And out of nowhere, in my mind, all I heard was Jesus first, Jesus last, Jesus first, Jesus last, over and over and over again. Now, my first thought was, Keith! <laughs> But as I continued to run and think, what I decided was, he's right. He's right. Friends, our lives as disciples have to be lived out every day in that fashion. Our first thought each morning and our last thought each night should be Jesus. The first place we go for advice and the last word on anything should be Jesus. The lens through which we see the world should start and end with Jesus. Every day should begin, every day should start with us praying to Jesus for wisdom and strength and courage to be the kind of people he wants us to be. And every day should end 
with us praying for forgiveness for all the ways we didn't that same day. Everything we say, everything we do, everything we think must start and end with Jesus. Jesus first, Jesus last. That's how we come to believe and recognize and experience that Jesus is with us always. Because, friends, he's there. We just have to be smart enough to realize it and believe his promise. Because, see, this great commission and the promise that Jesus gives us today, turns out it's not just for the big thing. It's for our everyday life as Jesus' disciples. And honestly, is that not the message that we want everybody to hear? I mean, this morning we honored our high school graduates. Don't we want them to know that no matter what they do from this point forward, that Jesus is going to be with them? That every day, whether they be days filled of trial or days filled of triumph, Christ is going to be with them? Because he is. Don't we want Eleanor B.? who we baptized this morning, to grow up knowing that Christ is always with her? Don't we want her parents to know that regardless of moments of fear or freezing or wavering, whatever it is, that Christ is with them? Because Emory's Christ is with you always. But friends, I want all of us to know that. Everybody that can hear my voice, be it in here or watching us online, Christ will be with you always. And we have to look no further than this altar where we'll celebrate Holy Communion in a little bit. Because as we remember the sacrifice made on our behalf and we come forward to partake and receive the elements, think about the words we associate with it. This is my body broken for you. This is my blood poured out for you for the forgiveness of of your sin. This is for you. This is for you. This is the Savior. This is the Lord. This is the Shepherd. This is the bread of life. This is the living water. This is the way. This is the life. This is the truth for you. Always. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, friends, I want us real quick to um, put our hearts and minds together to go back to the Lord in prayer. We do have offering boxes on either side of the sanctuary. If you discern this week a calling on your heart to bring a tithe, gift, or offering, uh, I encourage you to place it in an offering box once worship has concluded. But it's in uh, appreciation of your faithfulness as well as anticipation of future gifts. I'd like for us to pray at this time. So let us pray. God of all creation, we offer our gifts and gratitude this morning. Not just for what you do in our lives, but for who you are in our lives. You are with us in the person of the Father, the God above us. You Come to meet us as the Son, as God beside us. You empower us to do the work of kingdom building by the Holy Spirit as God within us, providing strength and boldness that we would never find on our own. May the gifts we give today be the tools that make the transformation of the world a reality. We pray in the name of one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Well, friends, as it is the first Sunday of the month, we do celebrate Holy Communion together as a family. And so I encourage you to find a hymnal closest to you and turn to page 12. We'll pray our prayer of confession together, and then we'll begin the liturgy on page 13. But for right now, turn to page 12 in your hymnal, if you would. Friends, Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. 
We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. My friends, hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners, proving just how much God loves each and every one of us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. Well, friends, as the forgiven sons and daughters of the Most High, I want to invite you now to stand where you are, turn to your neighbor on your left, your right, and front and behind, and pass the peace of Christ to one another. Friends, as you're returning to your seats, I invite you to turn to page 13 as we begin the great Thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through the prophets. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. Your Spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, and ate with sinners. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. When the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always in the power of your word and Holy Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and all these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. 
Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Well, friends, now as the fully reconciled and forgiven sons and daughters of the Most High, I want to invite you to join me as we say together our family prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. My friends, though we are many persons who make up one body, that body is the body of Christ, the body of a sinless, perfect one, broken, so that you and I who are broken can be made whole again. The cup of salvation over which we give thanks is the blood of our Savior, Christ Jesus, poured out for you and for me for the forgiveness of all our sin. For those assisting with communion, please come forward at this time. Friends, here at Mount Olivet, we practice what's referred to as an open table, just meaning that you do not have to be a member of our church to partake in Holy Communion. If you just feel so led to come forward, then we certainly invite you to do so. We'll start with this section first, and what we ask you to do, if you would, is to come down the uh, inside aisle here, uh, take the elements, and then you can either return to your seat or you can come to the altar rail and pray as long as, as you wish. Uh, after this section is done, we'll start with the choir, but after this section is done, We'll slide over and do this section. You guys will do the same thing, inside aisle, elements, then go back to your seat or pray at the altar rail, uh, middle section. Then after they're done, you'll come down this side, take the elements, and then go back to your seat. If you need gluten-free elements, we have those up here as well. Now, just as a reminder, let me ask you, do you need to put the entire piece of bread into the cup? No, just a little bit. Just put a little bit in there, okay? Because people coming behind you, right? So, and it's embarrassing for everybody if you <laughs> all right. Well, the table has now been set. Uh, choir, let you guys lead us off. But you're all invited now for Holy Communion.
Friends, before we get to our closing hymn, um, we blessed our high school graduates this morning. Um, but we had one that decided to join us at the 11 o'clock. <laughs> I don't want him to miss out on being blessed by this congregation. So Ian, if you'll come forward at this time. Now, many of you know that uh, Ian and his family moved up to the mountains towards the end of last year. And He's come back to walk in graduation uh, next week. And so we have for him, well, first of all, here's your certificate for the men's group scholarship that you received a few weeks ago. And then we also have for you a study Bible and then a book of God's promises that kind of goes through any particular life circumstance that you may have a question or a concern about. 
it has scripture references for you to seek God's word. So what I thought we would do, friends, is if I can have everybody extend their hands towards Ian, we're going to say a blessing over him this morning. Holy One, we give thanks to you for Ian and all the ways that you have worked in his life. And Lord, as he concludes one chapter of his life story and begins the next one, we ask that you continue to have your hand upon him, that you strengthen him and encourage him, that you make sure that his feet are pointed in the right direction, that you fill his heart and mind with your wisdom and with your knowledge. And Lord, we do also ask that all of us here continue to keep Ian in our thoughts and in our prayers, and that Ian feels those prayers, and that he knows that this community loves him and supports him and will continue to lift him up. We thank you, Lord, for all the giftings you've given to Ian, and we look forward to all the ways you will use him and his community. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's give him a hand. All right, so I invite you now to stand as you're able. We'll sing our closing hymn together. It's page 641, Fill My Cup, Lord, page 641. can honestly say we're putting it into practice. This week, friends, I encourage all of you to find one thing. What one small thing can you do to make sure that Jesus is first and last in your daily life? We go now to love and serve the Lord. Amen. Amen.